Hello and welcome to Lab to Launch, the new seminar series for researchers interested in pursuing entrepreneurship. I'm your host, Sarah Jane Murdoch, Administrative Project Coordinator for the Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship at UT Dallas and Operations Manager for the Venture Mentoring Service of North Texas. Joining us today is Steve Genrich, Associate Vice President, President for Innovation and Commercialization at the Office of Research at UT Dallas. Steve G is an experienced entrepreneur and investor serving as a co-founder or early employee of startups that have raised well over $200 million in the past 20 years. He brings a wealth of knowledge, connections, and expertise from his more than three decades as an entrepreneur, investor, mentor, author, and educator. He has written or published 12 books and dozens of articles about business innovation and information technology. In today's session, Steve will talk about what you can do to best position your research for an entrepreneurial venture, as well as cover the basics of the lean startup methodology, the model most used by founders. And now here is Steve Genrich. Well, good afternoon, everyone. This is Steve G and it's great to have you all with us today. Uh, this is going to be a fast paced session and although we have 45 minutes, I'm going to try and cover a lot of material in the next 25 minutes or so so that we can have plenty of time for questions at the end. I say plenty of time as if 15 minutes is a lot of time, but jumping ahead, you know who I am. This is how you get in contact with me and we'll make these slides available afterwards as well, but you can reach me at UT Dallas. I'm very active on LinkedIn. That's the social media you can find me on and you're welcome to call me or text me. Just be advised I don't pick up the first time, so you'll have to leave a voicemail. But once I know who you are, I put you in my caller ID and I know to pick up the next time. That's just my way. Uh, in particular, I wanted to highlight two things in the description Sarah Jane gave that are really the focus of my talk today. And those are the issue of best positioning your research. So I'm going to talk about that at the beginning. And then secondly, the basics of the lean startup methodology, because the lean startup really is the primary way I talk about putting a venture together for first time founders or experienced founders. So let's jump right in. This is a little picture that I use frequently of Austin. If you've ever been to Austin, you'll see this downtown, but I like it because the little Pac-Man symbology and the graffiti never give up very much resonates for me and for people that have ever been involved in an entrepreneurial venture. Now, if you're a faculty researcher, PhD candidate or postdoc, then you, you can sort of understand that your field and entrepreneurship are a lot alike. You're probably obsessed with your invention or your field of study, not just passionate, but obsessed. It's what you think about all the time. You rely on the scientific method. Creating falsifiable hypotheses, then developing experiments to sort of disprove or prove those hypotheses. And you often have to break the rules. It's just part of changing from one paradigm to the next. So that's where you're like. Where's your field and entrepreneurship different? Well, you probably use the language of engineering, uh, science, uh, perhaps the humanities, behavior, whatever your field is. And entrepreneurs use the language of business. And just like you wouldn't expect a business person who was trained in that area to really teach you how to do your area of research well in science or humanities. Similarly, I think it's worthy to understand that the language of business and entrepreneurship is a very um, large and detailed field of its own that there are people who have spent their whole lives pursuing. And so that's worth it to spend time with those people and understand how they can help you take your inventions to market. So. At UT Dallas, we have a couple of different significant resource sets for you to draw upon to help you do that effectively when you're thinking about a startup. First is the Innovation 
or excuse me, the Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship, which Sarah Jane mentioned, and at the top of that screen, you can see the URL for it, innovation.utdallas.edu. You'll find a ton of resources and assistance there. And the leader for that organization is Paul Nichols. There's his email address, and you can reach Paul and his team at any time. So I want to spend a couple minutes talking with you about the research wheel of progress, the intellectual property wheel of progress. And it begins at the top there with a research and development activity and it sort of works its way through a cycle that many, if not most of you on the call will be familiar with. So I want to focus in particular on this one at the uh, sort of the three o'clock position, reviewing process after inventions are disclosed, because this review process is one that's kind of a particularly crucial moment before you move on with the next elements of IP protection. Now, ideally, when you get into this period between disclosure and IP protection, in other words, really triggering the patenting or other copywriting process, these are the things that will assist you and your university, including UT Dallas, the most in. First is answering the question, do you have industry or venture partners already? Do they have budget to fund what you're producing? And do you have a relationship with somebody at an organization, industry or venture otherwise? If you do, those will give you a step ahead as you move forward with the patenting process. Is there a market need of any kind? Ideally, a sizable market need. Um, has that market need been validated at some level? Validated either through research that others have done, that you've done previously, or from the fact that there are already competitors with some kind of similar, perhaps um, less good product in the market. And then lastly, the thing that you'll want to really evaluate for yourself is, are you free of conflicts of interest? Do you have a venture set up that is conflict free? The more that you, you can answer these questions successfully at this review cycle, the more likely the university is going to be able to move forward rapidly with your IP protection process, invest the money in protecting your IP and move forward through the rest of the IP cycle. Now, to help you with those different elements at the Office of Research, and again, the URL you can find is at the top there, research.utdallas.edu, we have a tech commercialization group devoted to assist you in the IP protection process. And that's led by Brent Schultz, who's the director of the Office of Technology Commercialization at UT Dallas. And then specifically to this issue of conflicts of interest, which can really um, be disruptive for you if you haven't planned ahead when you're forming a separate commercial venture. We have a young man, Connor Wakeman, who oversees that activity and can really guide you through expert knowledge he has of how to be able to maintain your relationships and commitments to the university, but then also be able to be successful in moving forward with your venture. And Connor, by the way, I'll mention it now, I'll mention it at the end again too, has a, a handy little guide on sort of guiding you through the elements that are most important to, for setting up your startup. So the other key step in the research IP wheel of protection is at the bottom there the marketing inventions to industry, which begins ideally relatively soon in the process. And this is the point where many folks involved in the research activity think to themselves or perhaps others around them think, hmm, maybe I should start a startup. Maybe I should do a venture of my own. Well, this is where we move into a whole body of activity that I'll talk about and that is the lean startup methodology and what it takes to actually do that. But before I move forward, I'm gonna stop for just a second and ask Sarah Jane if she has any uh, pressing questions on the things that I've covered so far about terminology or other elements. Uh, Sarah Jane, anything in the queue that I need to hit right now? Uh, no questions yet, Steve. Okay, great. I'll jump right in and now I'm gonna fly through some of this. If you have questions, put them in the queue and we'll address them at the end. So the lean startup methodology, the first thing to be aware of when you launch a startup at the very beginning is you are here. You're at the bottom left of an S curve that you hope will go up 
up in revenues, up in funding, up in employees, and up in success. But you're starting at that bottom left hand. Here's the things that you have in front of you. It takes 58 new product ideas to get to one successful product. By the way, a successful product doesn't mean that you're going to be Google. It means that you've been able to last two years and still be in business. And oh, that successful product that you have in the market at that time, only in a third of cases are the original plans that founders start with the ones that they actually end up with. Two thirds drastically change their original plans from when they first start to the plans that actually introduce a product or service. So when that's the likelihood of what you have ahead, the goal in developing your startup is not the plan, create a better plan A, but to instead really work towards a path to a plan that works. And the lean startup methodology is a rigorous process for iterating from plan A to a plan that works. Now, the probably the best known author of the Lean Startup Methodology is Eric Ries, who came up with a book that's a bestseller on Lean Startups. And in that book, Eric says, startups that succeed are those that manage to iterate enough times before running out of resources. Speed, iterating fast, as fast as you possibly can with the product that you're trying to get to market. Resources, by the way, can be thought to mean not only people and expertise, but really money, money and time. So you're trying to go as fast as you can. A lean startup is also about focus, focusing on the right directions that are, excuse me, the right actions that are important to you and to the startup and ignoring everything else. That means, especially for first time founders, one of the hard realities that those things that you used to take for granted regarding nights and weekend time to spend with friends or family or travel, those things may have to be set aside for a period of time. Lean Startup is also about business model versus business plan. Here's what I mean by business model. Well, actually, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in the future, but the business model hypothesis, which is that you're trying to sort of get to a way where you can make money doing what you do in the startup, is what I'll talk about next. And the fundamentals of your business model hypothesis are the following. What's the problem that you're trying to solve? Who is your customer and how do you do it? That's the business model. That how do I do it part is the business model. Now business models don't have to be complex. And that little image that I have in the bottom right hand corner is an image from a book that I have that I'll, again I'll tell you more about at the end where you can get a free PDF copy of it. But it's really intended to sort of say that Business models, the simpler that you can make them, the more powerful that they can be. And in fact, you can even boil a business model down to an image like the following. Here's an example of a powerful business model. A company named Starbucks took an experience that previous before they were in the market was 25 cents commodity item and changed it into an experience that actually you're lucky if you can get a $2 cup of Starbucks today. They changed it into an entire different way of thinking about coffee as an experience. Similarly, Amazon really completely blew apart the idea of needing a retail store location to buy books. And so that was their business model in an image. Take a store, X through it. Now you're doing it electronically. Of course, the great irony is that Amazon and others are looking at boutique retail to introduce back in because they see the advantages of that part of it. So. This slide is busy, but um, it's one that we can take time to talk about later in an example. And I just want to point it out to you. This is the business model canvas. This is used a lot in planning your startup, more so than a 25 or 50 page business plan. This one page document can capture the key elements of what you're trying to accomplish in your venture. We can send you a copy of this or make a copy of this business model canvas actually a nicer looking version of it available to you at the uh, at the end of the session. But the key is that by having a single statement of all the different elements in your business model for your venture in one place, you could literally fold this up, carry it around with you and have a conversation on the fly with an interested investor, potentially a customer, another advisor that you're trying to uh, cultivate. It's a great way to be able to capture and force you into a terse clear statement of the different elements that are important to your venture success. What the problem is, your particular solution and its key features, 
what the most important activity is that you must do to drive retention and revenue, what your unique value proposition is. If you have an unfair advantage in the case of research faculty, it would be a patent or a patent portfolio. Channels, how you actually get to the customers that you're trying to reach, who those customer segments are, your cost structure, and then your revenue structure at the bottom. Those are the major components of the business model canvas. Now, there are three phases of the lean startup methodology. Very simply stated, there are the problem solution fit, the product market fit, and scaling. So we'll go through each of those real briefly. First, the problem, problem solution fit. What you're trying to do in this phase is validate. Do you have a problem worth solving? Is your problem worth solving? And I highlight the word worth there because that is the key word in this question. Sure, there's lots of problems that are worth that can be solved, but are they worth solving? Will people pay for them be, to be solved compared to the things that they can do today? It's either the inertia of trying to find something else or other substitutes that they have today. So is it worth solving? Now, the best way to solve that problem is through a process that I like to typically quiz people about on the question of how is marketing like fishing? And rather than take you through it, you'll see it in the book. But the answer to that is it's like fishing because while there are so many factors that people think of about fishing, like the location that you go fishing or the temperature or the time of day or the bait or the equipment or many, many things for what's the most important thing to think about. In truth, the most important decision that you make about fishing is what fish are you trying to catch? Because once you determine what fish you're trying to catch, everything else about how to catch that fish comes about. Similarly, once you really spend the time to deeply, deeply understand the customer that you're trying to reach, then you're able to understand more about the problem. And so in the problem solution fit, it's all about customer, customer identification, deep customer research and knowledge, understanding and validation of those customers. So on, when you translate that to the lean canvas, you're looking at these three cells in particular, the far right one, which is deep knowledge of who your target customers are, not simply consumers under the age of 50, but you want to be very precise, as precise as you possibly can be about your key types of consumers, the personas that some people might describe. So you're really working on these three areas in the, uh, the problem solution fit phase. Once you have an idea of your target customers and you have an understanding that you have a problem worth solving based upon the feedback that they provided you, then you move into the next phase of the lean startup methodology, which is the product market fit. And the key question to be answered here is, have I built something that people want? Is it something that people not only solves a problem, but is something that they will actually want when they see it and ultimately pay for it, certainly use it frequently and or pay for it? Now, the issue that people often encounter in this is that they take a long time figuring out what they think is what people want in development and quality assurance and iteration and finally they get to a point of releasing the product making it available and unfortunately during that time of development and qa and other activities there's not a whole lot of learning that goes on there's some learning that happens at the beginning when you're gathering requirements from your potential target customers but most of the learning when it comes to determining have you built something that people want happens at the end when you have the thing the magical thing that you show to people and they say, yeah, that's it. Or no, that's not really what I was looking for. Well, the solution to that is to try and condense the development cycle as much as you possibly can. And through rapid iteration, be able to give people different examples of what this thing is that it's going to look like or feel like or work like as soon as you possibly can and get their feedback on it so that you're constantly determining, are you on the right path are you going the direction that is what they want and get feedback from them on changes to the features. So in this particular part of the lean methodology, you're working on the solution in particular, the, the key features of the solution, 
that most important activity that drives revenue and retention of customers. And then, you know, as much as you can possibly crystallize it, the single compelling clear message that what makes you different and worth buying is. So those are the two phases, the problem solution fit and product market fit. The third phase is scaling. Now in the first two phases, what you've really been doing is working on validating everything that you find out and taking it as far as you possibly can and then doing what is known in the lingo as pivoting slightly changing that business plan so that you have a new business model that is more appropriate to the uh, the end state. In scaling, it's really all about growing, growing as big and as fast as you possibly can. And to do that, you go through a process of optimization. Now, let me give you an example of everything we've covered so far. So here's an example I want to paint for you. This is an example of, let's call it a lean startup example. And let's say that I, Steve G, or my twin, Fred G uh, wants to start a consulting venture called Broadbrush Ventures. And so the premise here is that the product is going to be blockchain technology, distributed ledger technology companies have trouble selling their offerings to the early majority of potential customers because they don't have references. Blockchain companies don't have references. It's a new market. So how will I help them? I will help them by introducing them to my client list, to helping to cover them in my research, to lending credibility of my brand, the Fred G. Broadbrush Consulting Ventures Company. And my customer segment in this case are founders and marketers of nascent blockchain companies. Those are my customers especially the ones that are trying to introduce something that is disrupted to the financial services market. Those are my customers. So that's the problem I'm trying to solve, help those people sell their offerings to early adopters. That's the solution that I'm giving them. And those are the customers that I'm trying to reach. This is a real example. In fact, here's a gentleman, Don Tapscott, who runs something called the Blockchain Research Institute. And that's essentially what Don does. He's written New York Times bestseller books. And he has a primarily research and services venture and he started it from scratch. And this is what he does with customers worldwide, companies that are trying to break into the blockchain field. So this isn't just an imaginary example. This is a real world example. So when you're coming to the market and you're trying to sort of solve this problem, it's really important not only to establish what your problem and solution and customer segment targets are early on, but you also want to kind of test the riskier parts of your business model. And that is this notion of an unfair advantage. What's the thing that I have that can't be copied or bought? Well, in this case, it's my gray matter. It's my brain. It's my knowledge and 30 years in the industry that, that competitors can't copy. My channel in this case, I'm hypothesizing, would be a personal authority website, basically my website that sort of tells what I know about blockchain and blockchain research. And I'm gonna sell it at $49 a month. I'm going to make it really low cost, almost freemium to start with, and then I'll see how that goes. Now, this is where the notion of uh, the scientific method comes into play, because what we're trying to do here is formulate falsifiable hypotheses. What you want to do is not lean on leap of faith hypotheses about how something will work or not work with your venture. You want to develop something that can be tested via an experiment. So a leap of faith hypothesis would be, if I'm known as an expert, that will drive early adopters, people who will pay $49. What's the problem with that? Well, I'm sure you can see right off the bat, my definition of what an expert is might be different from your definition of an expert. So how will we ever really know? If I get good results, I'll say, see, I was right. If I get bad results, I'll say, well, they had a different view of what expert was. They don't really appreciate that I'm an expert. If you change that to say a blog post will drive greater than 100 early signups, you can do an experiment and validate that. You either will or it won't. If it doesn't, that doesn't mean you failed. It just may mean that blog posts driving signups are typically going to get 10 or 20 or 50 signups, and that's what you'll have to rely on. But that's the kind of thing that you want to do all across your venture. And so this is a dashboard 
of all the different hypotheses that I'm testing against my business model canvas. So in the upper left hand corners of each of these rows, you can see the little pink coding that says, this is where I'm testing an hypothesis about my channel assumption. This is where I'm testing an hypothesis about my customer segments. In this case, early adopters will primarily be pre-product market fit companies. And finally, this is a hypothesis for testing my actual problem fit, the P. So the more you can develop experiments against all of your various assumptions, the better able that you'll be able to defend and really move forward with confidence with your product. You want to take that confidence and you want to share that in your board meetings with your advisors and investors. And the simple way to do that is simply to go through, this is what we thought. This is what our customers actually told us when we tested it. Those are the insights that you learn. And then based upon those insights, here's the next steps that we're going to go through as we do our experiments. And you want to track one or two key elements to your success, in this case, a revenue growth success. Now, recognize that you know whoever it is that you're speaking with your board or your directors at the end of the day they inform and help you but you ultimately must decide and that's why it's important to really take time and go with what your instincts tell you on your venture because ultimately you are the owner of the business you're the one that's making the decisions about and sacrifices on how to proceed and so you've got to make the final call so we've talked about the various areas of the lean startup methodology, problem solution fit, product market, a little bit about scaling. And again, as I mentioned, scaling is all about optimizations. And typically the most important thing that you're trying to do when you scale is you're trying to get the least cost, highest productive cost for acquisition of customers, what people refer to as the CAC or kind of crudely CAC, CAC, which is the cost of acquiring customers. That's typically the, the item that most investors and advisors focus on. Now, there are other areas that you can optimize to, but that ultimately is what drives growth. After you've gotten to product market fit, you're going to have some level of success because you know who your customers are and you know they want it. You've solved that problem question and that solution question. Now, you may not grow to be the size of Facebook, but you're likely to have some level of success, be able to make money. Small business is fine. Small businesses are great businesses too. They don't all have to be the result of a serial startup. That's the material I had to cover for you today. I'm gonna to leave you with a few resources before we go into the Q&A and then we can talk for a few minutes. First, as I mentioned, this book that I um, put together, it's a digest of personal reflections on some of the lessons that we've had here. You can find it at bit.ly slash ncthebook. Case is important, so it's all lowercase and all concatenated and see the book. You'll find the book there. You can download it. The, um, the second resource, back on that, one of those first website screen captures that I showed you, the Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship, the one that said innovation.utdallas.edu. Under the far right tab at the top, the resources tab, there's a sub tab called mentorship. And you can go to that mentorship tab and you can connect into a wide array of resources that we have available to everywhere from student ventures to experienced venture leaders. And I think Sarah Jane mentioned at the very top of the program, we have a new program that we're running across the UT system called the Venture Mentoring Service, VMS. She oversees that for UT Dallas. I believe there are VMS coordinators in all the regions in Texas and uh, we can assist you in getting connected with a VMS group, which is like a virtual advisory group. If any, if you've ever heard of Vistage or the Entrepreneurs Organization, EO, um, the VMS service provides some similar services to that. And then lastly, I mentioned Connor uh, has worked up a really handy startup conflicts of interest guide. Honestly, you all, this is a fantastic resource. It's only about a page and a half that you can read through and really guide you as faculty researchers, PhD candidates or postdocs. These are the key things that you need to think about and do as you look to setting up and participating in a in a venture that you've created. So you can reach Connor at utdallas.edu is easy to find and we'll have that piece that we can make available to you as well. So that's really I, I this is uh, this is me. Pondering your questions, hopefully I'll do at least as good a job as um, 
our expert there, and I'm open to taking any questions that you all have about the material I covered and uh, those related topics. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Sarah Jane. Fire away. Absolutely. Um, our first question comes from Vikram. So is beta releases or like, say, a Kickstarter campaign the most optimal way to build a product venture? That's a really good question. And and those are both, I don't know if I'd call them optimal, but they're both really great tools in the chest um, of doing rapid uh, validation during that product market fit period. So yeah, um, uh, I think most of us that are of a particular age old enough to know, um, I used Gmail as probably most of you did for many years when it was still called beta for a long time as Google really worked to perfect what they could make about that product um, to make it the strongest that it could before they really got rid of the beta tag. And Kickstarter is a really great way to be able to sort of test that product market fit as well, because essentially you are getting people to pre-purchase your product. A couple of comments about Kickstarter though, I'll offer up. Um, one is that uh, if, if you spent any time looking at Kickstarter, you know that it's really important to have a lot of pre-sales ready to go on Kickstarter before you actually ever even load and launch your Kickstarter campaign because Kickstarter success is all about momentum. And if you just sort of throw a product or a service up there and you don't have pre-sales ready to go that people can kind of fill your Kickstarter with, then the rest of the world that might be interested in it sees there's no momentum and the chances are you're much more likely to fail. The other thing about Kickstarter is, and the tricky part is, frequently people start off with a Kickstarter, and one of the things that they learn, which is important, but it's a hard way to do it, is that there are a lot of other costs to building their product and getting it into their customers' hands that they hadn't thought about. Okay, that's the good news. They've been able to sort of figure that stuff out early. The bad news is that they only have the armaments they got from their Kickstarter campaign to cover that activity and so frequently they don't have enough money to cover all the costs to get their Kickstarter premiums out to their customers. So they kind of have to borrow from the next funding round in order to meet their commitments. That's a frequent activity. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but you need to be prepared for that happening. Okay, go ahead, Sir Jane. Sure, our next question is, with the current state of the nation, pandemic, et cetera, is now the most opportune time to initiate a startup? Well, the short answer I would say is yes. The qualification I would say is um, it depends on what field you're in, what you're thinking about doing, and, um, and your ability to have capital to be able to sustain it, whether it's just your own personal capital through savings that you have to be able to spend time on the startup. I will tell you that um, there's a great long history of some of the best known brands and startups being created during terrible economic downturns. And if you look, go on Google and search for any of the recent down cycles, you'll see great companies all the way back into the 50s, 40s, 30s that were created during economic downturns. So um, downturns are times of opportunity. We'll definitely see five or 10 years out from now, great companies that have been created. I do wanna say one quick comment about the savings piece. And this is something that I encourage people all the time when you're thinking about a startup. And that is that um, the more that you can uh, work on your venture truly nights and weekends and not quit your job, the better off you'll be. By self-financing your venture in the early days, you'd be able to have potentially total control over the pace that you go, uh, the decisions to be made. Once you take in outside investors, you start to chip away at losing some of that control. Now, that can absolutely be a good thing. In fact, a, a critical thing because outside investors are very experienced about how to best take a new model and a company rapidly to market. But you have to really balance that with the loss of control and the company to potentially go a direction that you don't want it to go. So the longer that you can kind of take by self-financing it, the better. Okay, SJ. 
we have a lot of questions coming in, so we'll hopefully mm -hmm. we'll get through as many as we can. And those that we don't, by the way, I'll just offer up that I'm happy to go through those and uh, answer as many as I can to make available to people after the fact too. So go ahead. Yes, this recording will be available afterwards as well as I believe the chat. Next question, if you are new to the area, where do you find advisors? Well, go to that mentors tab I mentioned. If you're new to the Dallas Fort Worth area or you're new to the San Antonio area or Houston, whatever it might be in the Dallas area, go to that mentors tab I mentioned because there's a lot of great advisors there in every community in the nation. There's something called the Startup Digest. That's a, it's a spin out of Techstars. Just look up Startup Digest, you'll find it. And there's a Startup Digest blank in almost every community in the nation. There's a Startup Digest Austin, Startup Digest Dallas, et cetera, et cetera. And you can find and get weekly news from the Startup Digest in your community and a whole host of events and connections to people and articles that will assist you. In Dallas, I'll also do a shout out to the, uh, the Capital Factory, and the Dallas Entrepreneur Center as two other groups in particular that provide resources to startups. How does one start to answer the question, do I have a problem worth solving? Deep customer research. That's really the only way. There's a, a couple of things that you can look up on the web that will help you go deeper into, well, what does that mean, Steve? Deep customer research. How do I do that? Um, there's something that I, I ascribe to called the Lean Startup Machine, LSM, and they have some great material online that will take you through how to go about rapidly figuring out, do I have that problem worth solving? Now, from an academic perspective, um, and especially attuned to the needs and language of researchers, there's a program called i -Core, and the i -Core program is a program that's actually run at through both the NSF and NIH. And um, currently UT Dallas participates and is part of an i -Core hub, if you will, in the region that's led out of um, the Austin area. It's called the Southwest i -Core, uh, program. And so um, i uh, participation can help you with this question of validating the problem that you're trying to solve. And it goes through a little bit of a more, as you might expect, uh, researcher oriented process to do that. So i is a good way to do that. And there's money available for i teams, folks that go through i to, um, to receive if you go to the national level. And the last thing I'll say about completing an i program, again, which is a benefit to our research faculty, uh, wherever you might be, is that successful completion of an i program uh, weighs favorably on your application for an SBIR or STTR grant. If you uh, participate with one of those grants, having completed i will weigh favorably for you uh, in the evaluation process. Coincidentally, the next question was about i and you, you answered that, so that's great. Mm -hmm. um, so the next question after that is, biotech often require FDA's approval which might take additional steps and longer time in the commercialization. Would you mind giving some additional advice on commercialization of biotechnologies? Yeah, no, that's a really great question. And there's there's no way around um, a couple of realities uh, associated with that, but just a couple of short items that I'll, I'll offer up. Number one at UT Dallas, um, we have people that have kind of been through that process and that you can learn from some that are going through that right now. So we have local assistance and some of these folks will speak in some future versions of this particular talk at noon over the course of the rest of the summer. Um, so I point you to them and people that have been through the process themselves. Kind of on a related note, Dallas is the beneficiary of a group of advisors that participate in something called Health Wildcatters. And so the Health Wildcatters group is a great resource really for all of Texas, not just the Dallas region. We're beneficiaries of them being based here, but that do an extraordinarily good job of assisting companies and sort of navigating the FDA process, especially the early stages of determining what the right go to market for the regulatory approval for your product or service is. The last thing I would say just to sort of offer up is the more that you can engage with industry, this goes all the way back to my wheel of IP early on in that review process. 
the more that you can engage with industry early on and get industry interest in sort of the the vector of work that you're considering doing to the point where you can use industry interest either in letters to validate what you're working on for the FDA approval process or for other funding, the better off you'll be. So there's no easy answer for this one. It's one that requires expertise, prior experience, and real kind of peeling back the covers on the particular product or service to assist in going through what you have. And occasionally you get lucky breaks, uh, you might say, where rules can be sort of changed or updated in a way to allow for faster speed um, given current conditions like we're experiencing, for example, with the certain with the virus. Uh, great. So we have about five minutes left. Sure. Um, can you can you talk a little bit uh, to what degree your office works with the various areas of UTD research and how you see synergies with the different functions such as the IIE and the Center for Brain Health? You know, that's a great question. Yeah, we've got, uh, you know, UT Dallas and, you know, other tier one research universities are replete with a lot of different labs, centers, institutes um, that are, are led by people running research programs in each of those. The, the way to think about it at UT Dallas is the Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship is the, the umbrella cross campus organization for all things related to business innovation and going to market through entrepreneurial ventures. So the Institute is that cross campus program, if you will, that manages all the other sub programs related to venture activity. That's why I pointed out the website, the innovation.ut Dallas program. Now, it really has sort of a dual reporting relationship because it's the home for both the academic side of innovation, which is run out of the Jindal School, but it's also the home for all the experiential to roll up your sleeves work required to get a venture to market, which is what the Office of Research funds. So, um, so the Institute is really your starting place and the Office of Research works very closely and funds the, uh, the Institute's work as does JSON. So start there and then really the team at the Institute, Paul Nichols, Dresden Goldberg and others will direct you to the right resources that are required in other stages of tech commercialization beyond that. Like for example, uh, IP protection with Brent Schultz or vice versa, the, the groups work quite collaboratively where Brent might direct you to work with the Institute for your venture needs. Is it fair to say that I may make 57 futile attempts at initiating a startup before success, according to one of your slides? And if so, aside from tenacity, um, can you provide a couple other tips for continued forward motion? Uh, I would point to my train trestle that says never give up. There you go. Um, our next question comes from Will. How would you advise a new entrepreneur overcome the personal anxiety that comes from creating a new startup? Yeah, that's that's good. I appreciate that question, Will, because it's like anything else. The first time you do it, no matter how much confidence we have, there's a little bit of fear of the unknown. And that's what really makes, uh, and I think uh, uh, is something that I hope to encourage you all to take advantage of at, at UT Dallas, well, it makes the universities uh, commitment from the provost and the, the VPR so meaningful is that you really do have a chance to practice these things and get great industry feedback while you're here at the university to practice putting together your business plan, to practice the pitch, to meet people that are influential in the venture world, and to, uh, to try something out. Uh, the wisdom and understanding of how to be successful in the venture world is like anything else. It's hard earned and often through failure. And so what better time and place to fail than where you've got the support infrastructure like we have at UT Dallas to do that. Lots of funding and people are there to really help you along the way. Yes, I definitely second that. Um, unfortunately, we only have time for one more question. Um, so our last question will be, what if you have validated the problem, but customers are not willing to pay for the problem? Do you continue to work at this problem or is the business model not worth the time? There's something fundamentally flawed with the business model, given that little bit of description. And I would point the, uh, the questioner to a body of work that a, a gentleman named Ash Maria has done, 
His last name is spelled M-A-U-R-Y-A. Ash has done something with sort of a whole set of work in what he calls the customer factory. And he does a phenomenal good job because that is not that is not a rare condition. In fact, the questioner asked a great question. That's a very frequent, frequently encountered real life phenomenon of I've got I've validated the problem and the solution that I have, um, but people are just not buying my product. What's the problem? And Ash goes deep into that. Um, he's a very active lecturer, writer, um, et cetera. So I encourage you to follow up with him. Thank you, great questions. And I hope you've enjoyed the uh, the session so far. And um, I'll turn it over to Sarah Jane for closing out. Yes. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Steve, for sharing your time, talent, and resources. Uh, please join us two weeks from today uh, as I welcome Department Head and Professor of Bioengineering, Dr. Shalini Prasad, to the second Lab to Launch seminar, which will be on June 1st at the same time. Um, there's an announcement in the Q&A section for the link to view the complete seminar schedule and to register. Have a great afternoon, everyone.